Let us pray. Our gracious God, we are thankful for this day that you have given to us and for this opportunity to worship. We pray that your spirit might be with us and guide us in all that we do. That, Lord, you would open the word to our hearts and our minds and guide us that we might find that closer relationship with you and with each other. We pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. Today's scripture passage is an interesting passage because if we are to take it literally, then it has no real bearing on our lives whatsoever. We don't raise the dead any longer. It's a story of the past. It's something that may have happened long ago, but it certainly doesn't happen today. And in fact, for some people, it would actually cause them some stress trying to figure out how this might fit into some relationship with God if we believe that we actually had the power to start raising people from the dead. We know that doesn't happen anymore, with us anyway. And so we're consigned to try to figure out what this passage of Scripture has to say for us. What is its relevance? What does it say to, to us today? Well, I think it does have a message. A message that we need to hear because it shows us in a very real way the very kingdom of God and the nature of God himself. It shows us how God cares for everyone and how God has no favorites. Now that's hard for us to understand because we live in such a world where we identify important people and we follow their lives religiously. Everything that they do, we want to know about it. Facebook is an instant way of finding out exactly where you are and what you're doing and, oh, how important I am and why you need to know all this stuff. We live in a world of gossip magazines and reality TV programs that give us a glimpse into everyone's life more than we possibly care about. Have any of you not heard of Lindsay Lohan? Every week, something goes on with this girl. And this past week, I was saddened when I heard that Paris Jackson now is seemingly being sucked into this same mode of, of glamour and, and, and intrigue that's going to follow her for her life. And I actually read a blog this past week that was speculating whether when we all get to heaven, will we still hear about the Kardashians? <laughs> now that's the kind of world that we live in. That if you're not somebody, if you don't have power and a name and prestige, if you don't have someone following you, taking your picture all the time, then you're nobody. And so when we read this passage of Scripture written by writers long ago in cultures that we would find foreign, it's a miracle. For here in this story, Jesus identifies a widow and her dead son. The story centers around common people. They're not even given a name. We don't know who they are, who they were related to, all we know is that they had tragedy in their life. And that's the wonderful thing about God. You see, God is not impressed with who we are or what we have. God is impressed with our nature, our, who, our, our lives, our creation, for He is the one who made us. And He loves all of us. Every single one of us are within God's love and God's grace. And we work so hard to impress him, but most of the time I fear that we work the wrong way. For here this widow had lost her, her son, her only son, and now, according to the custom of the day and the land, she would probably be out on the streets begging because there would be no male to support her in her life any longer. And we get the story of Jesus as he comes and touches her life and raises her son. 
we see that God sees us. He knows who we are. The unfortunate thing is many times we work at trying to hide from God. We put on airs. We pretend that we're something that we're not. We like to give forth a good image. We'd want to impress God if we had that opportunity, and we try to. But God is usually not impressed with those things. Because you see, God looks more than just at our outward appearance. God not only sees our physical appearance, Being, he also sees our hearts and our souls. He sees our thoughts and our mind. And in the quietness of life, in the stillness, where we find ourselves, that's where God is. And God knows us in that place. But it's hard for us to get there because, again, we try to hide. We hide from God. We hide from each other. And yes, we even hide from ourselves because we don't want to take that time to be honest and to look at who we really are and what our lives are really about. And God has that ability to see who we are and to know our lives in just a moment. Jesus was coming into the village and he looked over and saw the situation and instantly he knew what was taking place He knew the woman's heart and he knew the woman's condition. He knew the prospects of her life. And he knew that she needed someone to touch her heart, to touch her life, and to make things different. You see, God not only sees, God understands. Now that's a miracle because half the time we don't even understand about why we do what we do. We can't even figure out all of our motives from time to time, and we certainly have a difficult time figuring out other people and their motives. And sometimes, if we're not careful, we can make harsh judgments about other people, about what they do and how they act, but we don't know the full story behind their lives. We don't know what they've come from or the trials and tribulations that they've endured We don't know their story. And so it's hard for us sometimes to know how to interact properly. But God knows. God knows our stories. He understands who we are. Better than we even understand ourselves. I've lived long enough to realize that people continually live out of experiences that they've had in their past. When I was a young minister starting out, I was assigned to a small country church, and every church has them, and you can tell exactly what generation they came from because this particular woman saved string and aluminum foil. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't throw away a piece of string or aluminum foil because she had lived through the Depression And she knew what it meant to do without. And so every time she came across, it was really interesting to see her at church dinners. I mean, she would just go through the line gathering aluminum foil. Now, I don't understand that. Because when I want aluminum foil, I just go buy some. But she had an experience that changed who she was and how she thought. Now, that's just a little minor thing about life, something that may make us more interesting than others. But we all have those things in our lives, in our childhood, in our experiences that have formed us and shaped us. And the difficulty is how do we get beyond it? Because if we don't, we become trapped in a generation or we become trapped in an experience Do you know people that are still fighting the Civil War? Yes, you do. And you know people that are still fighting because they've not been able to turn loose. God sees. God understands. He knows the depths of our hearts. He knows what we need in our lives. And so Jesus came to the coffin and he touched it and he said to the young man get up 
and the young man got up speaking. Now, to me, that's even two miracles. I mean, to get up is one thing, but to get up speaking is something else. And think what that would do to the assembly gathered there. They were frightened and fearful because suddenly this miracle had taken place. And they were astonished. And then they said that it's because God had found favor upon them, that God was blessing them. Now, raising this young man from the dead was to give this widow another chance at life, to give her an opportunity to survive, to to continue her life. In other words, God not only sees, God not only understands, but God enables us to carry on, to move forward in our lives. So we don't have to be stuck in the past. We don't have to be living in regret, but that we can live with God's assurance of grace and peace. And so I fully believe that God can come to us as we allow him to come and take our lives and take the scars of our lives and the pains and the burdens and the problems and the fears and the anxieties and with great compassion he can move and heal our souls, heal our hearts, heal our relationships, heal our spirits until we experience God's greatness and fullness and the abundant life that he has to offer. It's a promise that we can hold on to, a promise that comes to us from this passage of Scripture. This past week, several of us attended annual conference in Collierville, Tennessee. It was a good conference, typical too many reports and long, long days. But our new bishop was there, Bishop Bill McAlilly. And as he was getting ready to preside at his first annual conference, he set the tone for the conference and I think for all of us as Methodists within this Memphis conference. As he shared the theme, and the theme is simply this, expecting greater things. Our bishop is expecting greater things. Well, you see, the problem is if you don't expect anything, you won't get anything. But if you expect something, God has a way of blessing our expectation, our our desire, our longing. God has a way of blessing our hope of what could happen and what can happen as we trust in God. So this morning I expect God to continue to heal us and yes, to even raise some of us from the dead because death can take many forms. I expect God to continue to bless us, not selfishly, but to bless us in a way that we can make a difference in our community and in our world. I expect God to continue to be with us and to continue to blend us into that kingdom of God that doesn't look to people for their power or their prestige or their name, but looks to everyone, poor and wealthy alike, as members of the family of God. I expect God's great love to continue to be shown in each and every one of our hearts. What do you expect today? In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.